All right, so uh, this is a little different. I'm looking out my window and it's still light. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty nice. Like, uh, that's a nice antidepressant. Um, so welcome everyone to the second COVID tea time. Uh, today we're, we have a special guest is Dr. Ashley Bassett. She's the director of the Women's Sports uh, Medicine Center. Is that correct? I don't want to get correct. anything wrong. Yes. Please uh, fix it if I if I say something wrong. And that's a, that's with the Orthopedic Institute of New Jersey. Correct. Um, and so she's she's been kind enough to to do this virtually. And I've already invited her to kind of do one in person if we can get her uh, <laughs> again in the future once we open up. Um, and and as always, uh, Dr. Bassa, you're you and you know, everyone else who does this is welcome to. Uh, come to any of our events. We'll be doing some stuff uh, later in the year, hopefully on campus, which will be nice. And of course, if you had time, you're, you're invited. I know you're busy. Mm -hmm. um, but so uh, Dr. Bass has been kind enough to actually prepare a presentation first, uh, and then she's happy to take your questions. We've already been talking for a while and <laughs> I need to shut up. So uh, <laughs> welcome, Dr. Bassett. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to be here. So this presentation mostly is a it's a bunch of pictures, so you don't have to just listen to me drown on and on about you know my my journey through um, you know undergrad and medical school and then through residency. Um, I kept it pretty brief. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to stop me, or we can do them at the end. Also listed here, this is my email address. If you have any questions about um, you know applying to medical school, being in medical school, ortho residency, some of the other careers in sports medicine please don't hesitate to um, shoot me an email. Um, so we'll get started, hopefully. There we go, okay. So careers in sports medicine. So I'm an orthopedic surgeon, um, specialized in sports medicine, but there are a variety of other careers that you can choose if you're interested in sports medicine. So um, there's non-operative sports medicine physicians and you can get to this area um, through many different routes. So you can be an internal medicine doctor, you can be a family medicine doctor, emergency medicine uh, physician, uh, pediatrician actually. One of my very good friends, um, she was a pediatrician at Cornell um, in New York City. She did her residency there. She then did her fellowship in sports Sports medicine at HSS, and now she's the team doctor for the New York Mets, which when you think about it, it almost um, doesn't make a, a ton of sense. You're like, both they're a pediatrician and those are adults, but there's a lot of crossover um, between the different fields and doing a fellowship. She's now able to practice both adolescent and pediatric, but also adult medicine and, and now works with the New York Mets in New York City. So um, there's a variety of ways to get to um, the non-operative side of sports medicine. Other career uh, include physician assistant or PAs, nurse practitioners, physical therapists, and athletic trainers or ATCs. So today we're gonna focus primarily on, on orthopedic side because that's what I do. Um, but if you have any questions about the other sides, please feel free to ask. So how do you become an orthopedic surgeon? So you guys are right about, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but you guys are right here. So high school, you know, four years, then you go on to college and, and four years of that. And you can notice all these have asterisks because honestly, after high school, um, you know, it can be four years or it could be more, or in some cases, as I'll touch upon, it can be less. Um, so in college, um, typically four years, but some people are starting to do this um, gap year um, between college and medical school where they do a year of research. Um, just one to solidify that they're interested in medicine, but two, um, just to gain some more research experience to make them a competitive applicant. Um, also, if you were another major in undergrad and then decide you want to go pre-med, you may have to take some pre-med uh, requisites. So you may have to do a post-bac. Um, once you get into medical school, again, that's typically four years, but there's a lot of more um, combination programs that are coming out. So MD, PhD is one um, where you get that dual degree, MD, uh, JD, where you get a law degree as well as a medical degree. And uh, many of my colleagues did MD, MPH, where they got a master's in public health, which is an additional year. So it is four years traditionally, um, but it can be more. Um, it also can be less. There's a lot of medical school shifting towards trying to make it a three-year um, curriculum as opposed to a four-year um, by bringing in the clinical aspects early on. So that would be nice to shave off a year because this whole process, as you can see, if you add up the numbers, ends up being quite long. So if medical school would be three years, that might be great. Um, orthopedic residency programs are typically five years. Um, I shouldn't say typically they are five years. They can be longer than five years. Um, if you want to do, again, a research year. I've had a couple of my colleagues um, travel for a year to another country to do more of a global health um, type elective. Um, so there's a variety of things you can do, but the core is five years. Um, and then most people are going on to a fellowship to subspecialize in something else in orthopedics. So I chose sports medicine. You can choose a variety 
variety of other um, subspecializations. And because apparently we're a group of overachievers, um, some people are choosing to do more than one fellowship now. So they're doing pediatric sports or pediatric foot and ankle or foot and ankle sports. So you can do more than one fellowship, but really at this point, you probably just kind of want to get on with your life. So um, that's what I did. I did one fellowship in sports medicine, and then I started my career. So a little about me. Um, so usually I feel like when people start talking about where they're from, they, you know, say they're, you know, they grew up in Pennsylvania and then they did their medical school out in, you know, UCLA and then did something in Texas and then Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and, and move all around. But I'm pretty boring. I like the cold um, and the Northeast and apparently a lot of traffic um, because I stayed here for all of my career. Um, so my map ends up looking something like this. I grew up right here in New Jersey, in Ridgewood, New Jersey. I went to Ridgewood High School, um, then went to undergrad at the University of Rochester, and then came back for medical school in New Brunswick at Rutgers Medical School, did my surgical training at Harvard in Boston, and then I came back to Philadelphia for my sports medicine fellowship at the Rothman Institute at Thomas Jefferson. And I'll take you a little bit through my journey, but my two main goals for this um, talk are to emphasize really two main things. So one, um, you do not have to, nor really should you know exactly what you wanna do right now in life. Um, throughout my journey, I thought I was gonna be something else and then had an experience and it kind of led me down a different path. And that's how I ended up in orthopedic sports medicine, something I never thought in high school that I was going to you know, go into. Um, and then you never know what, you know, what experience is going to be the one to kind of you know, awaken that. So picking, taking the opportunity to do every experience that comes your way, I think is really beneficial. So getting on with my journey here. So I went to college at the University of Rochester in upstate New York. Um, I majored in biochemistry. Um, and at that time, I thought I was going to be a uh, researcher. I was planning on working in a lab, didn't know what kind of lab, but I was very interested in cardiovascular research. So that summer, I believe it was between my second and third year of undergrad, I worked at the Mount Sinai Hospital and Cardiovascular Research Lab with Dr. Roger Hajar, who's pictured here. Um, and I enjoyed my time there. And part of the summer internship was one day a week rotating in the cardiology clinic, where you guys actually interact with the cardiology patients that had the diseases that we were studying in the mice. And that was really enjoyable. And as my summer went on, I realized that I really didn't look forward to being in the lab and running the gel electrophoresis and, and you know, waiting for them to develop. And I really enjoyed being in clinic and interacting with patients. And so that was really what motivated me to switch in college from being a, you know, planning to be a scientist to being pre-med. Um, and so I switched that between my second and third year. So upon beginning my third year, I went full go pre-med, which really wasn't that hard because I was already a biochemistry major. And Chris and I were talking about this a little bit at the start that, you know, if you're a science major, you really can kind of decide to be pre-med anytime before junior year, um, because junior is usually when you take your MCATs, um, versus if you're, you know, thinking econ or poli sci, you may have to know that a bit sooner. But again, you know, it's, if you end up having to do more courses later on to make sure you make the right choice, that that's okay. But for me, it was a little bit of an easy switch because I was already doing a lot of those science courses. So after taking the MCAT, applying, getting into medical school and graduating. I then went to medical school at Rutgers. It was formerly known as UMDNJ, Robert Wood Johnson, and now it's Rutgers Medical School um, in Piscataway for the clinical side of things, or for the um, lecture side of things, the kind of basic science. And then in New Brunswick, a university hospital for the clinical side of things. So medical school, as I was kind of touching upon, Every medical school differs, but usually the first two years are very similar to what you're doing in school right now. You're sitting in a classroom, you're listening to lectures, you're studying and taking written examinations. The second uh, half, so years three and four, are typically clinical. So that's when you're working on the wards, you're doing internal medicine and surgery and OBGYN and emergency medicine, and you're getting really your clinical um, steps in. A lot of places are starting to switch towards integrating those earlier on, so you get a clinical taste during your first year and second year a little bit, but most medical schools are still following this traditional curriculum breakdown. So when I started medical school, I thought I was going to be a cardiologist based on my summer experience. Um, and then I did anatomy lab at the end of my first year, and I just immediately wanted to go into surgery. I just really liked um, this, you know, dissecting. I, I just really liked that aspect of it, specifically in the limbs, which is how I decided to go into orthopedics. So after um, finishing medical school, I did my surgical residency at the Harvard Combined Program, named so because it's a combination of a bunch of different hospitals in Boston. I um, won't list them all here for you, but we rotated it through at least four different hospitals, not including the VA and ancillary sites, and it was a really great experience. 
So ortho residency typically, as I said, is five years. Intern year really is a mix. Some places just have you do all general surgery. Other places, it's it's kind of a different rotation every month. That was mine. So for intern year, we did emergency medicine, vascular surgery, plastic surgery. Um, we did um, ortho night float. So we got a taste of what ortho was like at nighttime when it was a little slower. We had time to kind of adjust to um, orthopedics. Um, and so we did a variety. We did radiology, anesthesiology. So we did a kind of a hodgepodge of different things. Years two through five are pure orthopedics and you rotate through all the specialties that are listed here. So these listed here are the different subspecialties that you can specialize in. So shoulder, elbow, hand, upper extremity, spine, joint replacement, which is primarily hip and knee, foot and ankle surgery, sports medicine surgery, pediatrics, and trauma. And as I said, probably aside from trauma, there are some people that are doing dual, um, I guess you call it dual majors, dual fellowships um, in two different areas um, to really become super subspecialized. This is a picture of me. All the other pictures have been kind of mock pictures from like Google images. Um, but this is actually a picture of me and my um, trauma team at um, MGH when I was a chief. Um, and so here it kind of highlights the different things you can do in orthopedics. Um, Mike was a PA. Um, Kathy is a nurse practitioner. Um, this is one of my attendings back here. This is one of the fellows um, who's a, a trauma fellow. And then we were the chiefs and these are our junior residents. So a really kind of great um, camaraderie, really great team, uh, really awesome experience. Medical school and residency is hard, but it's also a ton of fun. So then after completing my um, my residency, I then went on to fellowship at Rothman, um, where I took care of the Philadelphia Phillies and Flyers and Eagles and Sixers. Um, here's a picture of me and some of my colleagues on the um, at the link um, after an Eagles game. Um, we got to meet some really, really uh, great people in the field. Jimmy Andrews, who's a, a guy who takes care of a lot of the NFL and MLB players. It was just a really awesome year where I subspecialized in sports medicine and really got to learn the ins and outs of both the non-operative side as well as the surgical side and got to do awesome team coverage. So it was a great experience. So then I finished fellowship and I was actually a full-fledged real-time orthopedic surgeon in sports medicine. So what do I do on a daily basis? So basically it can be divided into clinic, OR, and team coverage pretty equally, although with COVID team coverage is basically zero because sports are on hold. So it's mostly clinic and OR, um, but with team coverage starting to come back now that you know COVID is hopefully going to be moving away. So clinic, so I do clinic about three days a week. Um, so I should start off by saying every practice is different, but mine's a private practice. Um, we don't do trauma call. So I work Monday through Friday, but we do cover an orthopedic urgent care on the weekends um, where people can come in with a variety of orthopedic issues and be seen by an orthopedic surgeon. Um, so typically I'm working from Monday to Friday unless I'm working in urgent care that Saturday and Sunday. Um, so clinic, I'm usually doing about three days a week, sometimes three and a half, depending on how the week shapes up. I see patients and I should also say these pictures are pre-COVID. Um, they were when I first started my practice, and so now obviously we're all wearing masks. Um, but I see patients, I do a physical exam, as pictured in the picture on the left-hand side. And then a large portion of my time with patients is spent is describing their diagnosis, using models, showing them their imaging, and really talking through to make sure that they understand it. So I know that's a lot of where I'm, I'm trying non-operative treatment first, then if they fail that, talking about surgery, what that entails, what their recovery will look like, things like that. The other half is OR. It's usually about a day to a day and a half. I have a solid day once a week and sometimes additional days here and there for more urgent cases. Um, I work with my PA who's pictured, this is me here, and this is my, my PA, Vicky. Um, and we work together, um, you know, often in the operating room to, you know, just just make sure that, you know, we're, we're taking good care of patients and, you know, she'll get the patient in the operating room and positioned. And then I do, you know, I do my surgery side and then she helps me with that. So it's, it's a really good team environment. Um, this is at specialty surgical center, but I operate at a couple of different places. And then honestly, the most fun side of, of orthopedic sports medicine, I mean, I'm, I'm biased. I love sports, which is a big reason why I went into sports medicine, but is the team coverage side of things. I mean, from the high school to collegiate to professional level, it's just really fun to be on the sidelines um, with athletes that are, you know, you know, competing in this game um, and getting to getting the privilege really of getting to care for them. So um, this is here, the Eagles training room. So for, I'll use that as an example. So in addition to covering games, we're in the training room at least once a week, um, seeing them, seeing their injuries, determining who is safe and not safe to, you know, can, you know to play that week, et cetera. Um, and then for here, this is a picture of me and my parents actually at spring training. Um, so spring training is a big portion of determining, you know, narrowing down the team for the MLB, um, who, who's 
going to be taken based on their injury profile, who's, you know, maybe not fit to under, you know, to be taken that season, et cetera. So um, really great experience um, all around. And, and again, at the, not pictured here, but I worked with a lot of the collegiate teams in Philadelphia and a lot of the high school teams as well too. And I do around this area too. And it's just a very rewarding experience. So I guess I'll stop there um, and see if anyone has any questions. I have a question. Yes. What is your toughest orthopedic surgery that you had to do? Uh, so <laughs> that would be, um, so there's something called a hemi pelvectomy, um, which basically is for um, cancer that has affected the, um, the pelvis basically. And you have to take out the entire half of the pelvis, hemi meaning half and pelvectomy meaning removal of the pelvis and replace it with a cadaver pelvis um, so that you can save the limb because you could technically just take the pelvis but then you would have to take the whole leg um, which then obviously is an amputation for that patient. Um, so we basically go in there, take out the pelvis that has the cancer um, and then put this cadaver or this donor um, pelvis back in and then put the hip joint back in um, and then sew everything up. So that was in my training, that's orthopedic oncology. That's some of the hardest surgeries um, that you'll see. I'm realizing now I left orthopedic oncology off my list of subspecialties. So um, that's also one of the ones you can go into. Um, and it was a uh, really challenging, but really amazing procedure to see that patient walk again when otherwise they, they would have to have a prosthetic. What's the most common surgery you do? So I would say Currently, it's probably a mix between ACL reconstruction and meniscus, probably leaning towards meniscus. Depends on the year for ACL. So when football and soccer are coming around, ACLs are pretty prevalent. With COVID, those sports kind of hit the back burner. But with skiing, um, a lot of people injured their ACLs. So I was doing a lot of ACL surgery. Um, but meniscus surgery can, you know, meniscus injuries can happen with even just stepping wrong off of a curb. So I would say probably meniscus surgery is the number one, which is an arthroscopic surgery where you go in and either repair the meniscus or clean it out. Um, and then probably followed by ACL. You said you weren't originally drawn to like orthopedics. What was your, I guess, initial career idea? And then what kind of then pulled you towards orthopedics instead? So um, initially for me, um, even before medicine, I, I, I kind of wanted to do something in science. So my mom was um, a high school chemistry teacher. So it's not like she forced me to, but science was just everywhere. And so I, I just I just naturally loved science. So I knew I wanted to do something in science. And it wasn't until I was working in a lab and realized how I felt that was and again, nothing against lab work, but I just felt very isolated that I wanted to interact with people that pushed me towards medicine. Um, I think when you get to medical school, you'll know pretty early on if you want to be a surgeon or if you don't want to be a surgeon. That's a pretty like distinguishing thing. Either you love dissection, you love waking up at four o'clock in the morning and, and standing on your feet all day in the operating room, or you don't. And um, and so for me, I just, I loved it. Like I loved um, the dissection side of things. And then I really loved being in the operating room. So that kind of led me towards um, orthopedics, or I guess I should say surgery. What led me towards orthopedics is that rotating through a lot of the specialties, I found that orthopedics really enabled me to fix people. People had a broken bone, we put it back together. People had a cancer, we took it out. Um, people had a torn ACL, we reconstructed it. It was like, it was broken, now it's fixed. Versus I felt like a lot of other aspects of medicine was potentially temporizing. Um, it wasn't really like a, a true fix. And I really liked that about orthopedics. For sports, that's an interesting thing. I went into sports not thinking I was going to my sports rotation second year, thinking I was not going to go into sports medicine. I was going to go into hand. Um, I was very, I like the details of hand surgery. It's a micro surgery. I really liked it. Um, but it was really the team coverage aspect of it and the patients that sold me on it. The patients in sports medicine are just very um, driven. They're very passionate about getting better. They're the most motivated patients that I've ever interacted with. Like they just want to get back to doing their activity. And I just love that. So that's what kind of shifted me away from hand surgery um, and into sports medicine. What would you recommend for someone who wants to go into sports medicine? So 
I think having any experience whatsoever in sports medicine or orthopedics or, or any of that early on is important. One, it'll confirm that you want to do that. And so it sounds like you may. Um, and so I hope that persists through those experiences. But like I said, those experiences that I had kind of shifted me away from certain things and towards other ones. So for, for sports medicine, you know, there's, I have people shadow me. Oh, well, I did pre COVID. I still do now, not as much in the operating room because of COVID concerns, but asked to shadow people, whether it's a sports medicine doctor, you can shadow a physical therapist, you can shadow an athletic trainer. And that way it can really show you um, what a day in the life is, you know, what, you know, what, what is the clinic like? What is your interaction with patients like? Um, because, you know, what you maybe see on TV or what you hear when you're reading things is not necessarily the day in and day out um, that they're seeing. And so shadowing can be a really great way um, to, to show you what you like in sports medicine. The other thing is any any experience is good experience from showing that you're interested. So I started doing ortho research my first year of medical school um, just because I wanted to get involved in research. And that really helped me, even though it ended up being in pediatrics, even throughout applying to fellowship. The fact that I had a publication in my name really helped. So any research, any involvement just shows that you're interested and that you're passionate about it and just, I think, will help you um, moving forward. What's the most challenging part of your job? So that's a good question. I would say as a sports person, as sports specific, I would say the hardest thing is breaking news to a young athlete that they're out probably for the year. Um, I, I don't mean this to belittle, you know, um, you know, orthopedic oncology, but sometimes I feel like I'm breaking to people like that they have a terminal illness or that, you know, they have cancer because it's just that devastating. Um, they, you know, took to the field playing soccer and they're out for an entire year. That team is gone. That camaraderie is gone. Their ability to be active and go run and things like that is gone for a solid year. And it can feel, it can, it can really, um, lead to some, some, it can be hard. It can be mentally hard on people. So that that's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing, the hardest thing about orthopedics just in general is as orthopedists, we want to fix people. And there are some things that we can't fix. Um, and so there are, they're not that common in orthopedics, but there are some, and um, that's really hard to have a discussion with someone where, you know, the they're having pain in their shoulder. We get an MRI structurally. There's nothing there that I can fix. And I have to look at this person that's having pain and tell them, I, I can't fix what is ailing you with surgery. And those are really hard discussions to have. So I would say it's probably two part. What made you want to work at a private practice as opposed to a um, hospital? That's a good question. So I thought I was going to be academics my whole career. I mean, doing my residency at Harvard, it's very academic. Um, and so I thought that was what I was going to go into. And then I did my fellowship at Rothman and they're more, they like to call themselves private emics. So they're private practice, but they're associated with an academic center. And I just found that gave me a lot more independence to do what I was interested in doing. Um, I still was able to stay academic. I still give presentations. I go to conferences. I do research. Um, I just started a podcast with one of my colleagues from Harvard. Um, she's out in Colorado. She's a sports medicine surgeon in, in Denver. So I'm still able to do a lot of the academic and teaching aspects that I like, but on my terms. Um, and it also allows me, um, because we're a smaller group, to kind of seek out opportunities independently. So if I want to express my interest in helping out a team, I can just do that. There doesn't have to be a lot of, I guess you could say, politics involved with it. The downside of being in private practice definitely is you lack the infrastructure for really high level research. Um, and that's not a bad thing for me because level one randomized controlled trials are not something that I am very passionate about moving forward for my career. But if it is, it can be hard without a research assistant and medical students or you know undergrads that can help you with that, that research and, and data mining and, and publication. Um, but I just found that that was less of a priority for me. So having the independence to be able to um, dictate when I did what I did and then having the lifestyle to be able to um, enjoy my life while also practicing orthopedic surgery. Um, those are probably the two, the two main motivators. What does your physician assistant do to help you? 
So right now, currently, my PA is primarily just surgical. Um, so she is in the operating room with me for every case. Um, so she's, you know, if you're, if I'm doing an arthroscopy, I'm holding the camera in one hand and an instrument in another, and I don't have, I wish I did, a third hand or a fourth hand. So she's using another instrument to help. Um, so for example, like rotator cuff repair, I'm using an instrument to pass a suture through the cuff, but someone else has to grab it, but I'm holding the camera. So she'll come in, grab the suture, and then I grab it back out. And that's how we, we do the procedure. So she'll assist me um, in almost all, if not all, of my surgeries as kind of my second pair of hands. Um, other orthopedic surgeons do have physician assistants that see their post-operative patients and patients in clinic. Um, I prefer, you know, I'm early on in my career, I prefer to see my patients all um, post-operatively and see my patients all pre-operatively. I just feel like it allows me to really um, make sure they're doing okay, keep a close eye on them, things like that. But as people have been in practice for 10, 15, 20 years, their PAs do end up seeing a lot of their patients that are follow-ups and post-operative patients and pre-operative patients, and they're mostly seeing the new patients who want to have a surgical discussion. Uh, did you open up the private practice by yourself? I did not know. I joined a private practice. Um, I actually met, um, so I joined the Orthopedic Institute in New Jersey. Um, Tony DeFalco um, started that practice um, with Paul Tasia um, many years ago. And I met Tony DeFalco at um, an Eagles game. I was covering the Eagles Giants game at MetLife and he was covering as well for the Eagles as well. And we met and we got to talking about, you know, where I was going after fellowship. And that's kind of, you know, again, those experiences, right? Like one thing leads to another conversation. And then I realized that after hearing about his practice, it was just, it was the perfect practice for me for all the reasons I kind of just listed after that previous question. Um, and so I interviewed and that's how I ended up here. Um, it's not impossible, but it is hard nowadays to start your own private practice. It used to be just kind of like rented out of space and you post it up and you just saw patients and took them for surgery. And now there's a lot of um, overhead that goes into it. There's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of um, insurance authorization and a lot of a lot of things that just have to go into being able to care for patients and get them ready for surgery and care for them after that at least in my opinion, I felt like I needed some sort of an infrastructure there um, that was already established to help with that. So we're not a large private practice. So I think we're like 15 surgeons at this point with probably about eight to 10 PAs and uh, a nurse practitioner and you know radiology techs and things like that. Um, but we're not like, just, it wasn't just me or me and one other surgeon. What was the hardest part about either your residency or med school or just your schooling in general? So, honestly, I would say, so medical school, I feel like you guys are all a bunch of smart students. So I think I found medical school, it's just a lot of studying. It's just a lot of like reading and studying and you've been doing that in your schooling. I didn't find medical school to be I don't want to say terribly challenging, but it wasn't impossible. People make it sound like you'll hear like it's like drinking water from a fire hose. It's it's manageable if you've been a hard worker and a studier all your life. So that wasn't, I found particularly like the hardest part. Residency was definitely challenging. The early years, you're, you know, you're the person who's seeing all the patients and doing all the rounding and all of that, especially on trauma. You're there very, very early. You're there very late. So, you know, you're not sleeping a ton. It's just, you're working very hard. Now, granted, those things are changing um, with ACGME, which is the governing body of, of residency programs, kind of saying that there has to be work hour restrictions and things like that. So that's getting better. Um, but definitely that was the hardest, the early years of residency where you're just working very hard while also trying to learn orthopedics. Um, you're caring for patients but at the same time you're learning how to care for patients so it's kind of like you're going in a circle a little bit um that was definitely challenging but really you know all worth it in the end what keeps you wanting to go back to your job on a daily basis i would say my patients it's a big reason of why I chose, you know, orthopedic sports medicine. Like I said, the patients are just 
They want to get better. They are devastated by their injury and they just want to do everything in their power to get better and to get back to doing that sport. And that kind of motivation motivates me. You know, they, they want to get better so badly. Like I got to get there and, and help them get better. So, um, I just, I really love that side of it and it can be hard. It can be hard to watch some of these athletes struggle and, and have to go through this long rehabilitation associated with their injury. But when you see them on the other side, when they're getting back to playing their sport and they're going off to college to play that sport in college, it's just, it's very, um, it's very, very rewarding. So that's definitely the main thing that motivates me. Would you say the return on investment for orthopedic surgery is valid? Yes, I would say so. Um, I would say so. It's definitely, it's a lot of years, but you're, you know, you still have a quote unquote job residency on, you're getting paid, you know, for, for what you're doing and you're training at the same time. Um, and then afterwards, yes, you make, you make a very good living, um, hours, depending on what you go into, you know, academics, you're definitely working more hours than say I am in private practice. Um, but you get other benefits of, of academics associated with that. Um, so yes, I would say it definitely is. However, I always, and not saying that this is what your question was getting at, but I always encourage people not to do um, something for the money. For instance, if you were going to go into something for the money, probably like neurosurgery is maybe one of the best ones, maybe plastic surgery. I'm pretty sure it's neurosurgery is the number one for spine. And like, you couldn't pay me enough money in the world to be a spine surgeon. Like I just, I, I actually joke with people that like if orthopedics disappeared and I had to do spine surgery, like I'd find another job because I just, I don't like it. And so you have to, you have to love what you do. You know, you have to like going in or else money, it doesn't make a difference. Um, you, you still be unhappy. So you find a field that makes you happy, but also, yes, that, that pays you what you want to be paid. And when was that moment for you where it clicked, where you wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon? Man, that was like, that was early on. That was, you know, part of it was when I was in anatomy, but then our medical school had a great ortho program. Um, it was at, you know, at Rutgers at um, Robert Wood Johnson. And so I just started shadowing um, around my first year. And I remember I got to clinic, things were a little bit different back then. Um, now it's like, you know, it's the only people giving injections are, you know, actual you know physicians and they're under the guidance now there's a lot more checks and balances but back then like you know it was like oh you do you want to do this injection go ahead go do the injection and i was giving injections i was casting people i was doing fracture reductions and it was really um it was really exciting like i went from like learning about things in the class you know in a classroom to actually doing them and it was just awesome and that's really when it clicked for me and initially because of that i i thought that i was going to go into pediatrics because that was most of my experience pediatric orthopedics um and then when i got into residency then it was hand surgery and then switched to sports medicine. But um, it was pretty early on, like first year of medical school. You made a comment before about like, like med school is mostly just like reading and studying. Mm -hmm. And that like, I used to, the innate ability to like enjoy like studying and like hard work. Like to what extent did you have to like learn that to kind of keep up with med school versus like what you kind of already like doing at the time? So... And I think it, it differs person to person and like uh, prior experiences. But for me, like my my major being biochemistry and at the University of Rochester, which was like a strong science school. And we were taking uh, my colleagues and I that were pre-med and biochemistry at that time were taking a lot of classes at the medical center. So I felt like that gave me a little bit of a intro into what like medical school and graduate school level courses were like when I was in undergrad. And so it wasn't that much of a of a change for me. For medical school, what I what I found is that you're all in kind of the same boat. So unlike some other schools, so my sister's a lawyer. She went to law school, um, and she says there it's just all competitive. They're all just kind of I don't say at each other's throats, but no one's helping anyone. It's not like that in medical school. There's not really rankings. It's like how you do, what your GPA is, and that's really what what matters. And so you really work together. So everyone's in it together. You know, you're all studying together. You're all doing like you know presentations together. You're all going to the lab together to study before the next day's anatomy test. So it makes it a lot less, um, I think, a lot less painful. I, I actually found it to be kind of fun. But then again, I mean, as I said, I always liked science, and I really never disliked studying. So that was always just uh, something that was okay by me, but I felt like it made it a lot more um, palatable, you know, being in that boat with other people. 
Dr. Bassa, can I ask, uh, make one request and then I have a question. Could, sure. If, if you don't have any more slides, could you end your presentation? That oh, way sure. I'm so sorry. Can... Yes, absolutely. No, 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 that's fine. So uh, stop and, presenting. And, yes. and then my question uh, was going to be, you, you said that you don't know if they still allow people to do that now, right? The setting, the injections, all of yeah. that stuff. How do they expect people to learn if that's yeah. not a thing? I'm just wondering yeah. what the perspective, your perspective is on that. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a balance. I feel like um, when I hear about how things were like, let's, let's rewind even my, my, my training time. So I was training and I graduated, uh, you know, I graduated medical school in 2013. So I started medical school in, two, in 2009. Um, so that was, you know, that was the time that I was in that medical school training where we were getting to do things in the OR and in the clinic. But if you rewind it to like, you know, 20 years before that, I mean, residents were being left alone with zero experience in the OR to operate on patients. So like, obviously that's not right either, right? Because that's putting people at risk. So there has to be a balance. And I do, and th maybe this, this is a controversial comment, um, but I do feel like it's swinging too much in the opposite direction. Um, we're not, I think, allowing a lot of our medical students and residents to get some of the hands-on experience they need. Plus a lot of the work hour restrictions, which I do think are important. Don't get me wrong. I, you know, working for 36 hours straight, you're not making good clinical decisions after 24 hours, um, but you're not, you're missing those hours. And so people aren't getting as much experience as they should. They are trying to supplement this with VR. So a lot of orthopedic virtual reality um, companies have come out where basically you put on, you know, the VR goggles and you, you simulate surgery, but it's, it's not the same thing. Um, so definitely, I think it takes a bit of a hit, which is kind of all the more reason why, if you're interested, getting involved sooner rather than later. Because for me, you know, if I'm working with someone and I show them how to do an injection a couple times, maybe then they do an injection. Maybe the next experience they say, well, I've done this injection. Can I do that? And maybe then they get to cast. So you have to kind of seek out and build those experiences a little bit more now because they're not as um, readily handed to people because of a lot of those restrictions. Some of you asked me today about if, if I could do brain surgery on a human, which was an absolute no, but that's kind of the reason. Like, I, human brain has a certain texture. You mm -hmm. don't want to be learning on the fly like that, right? So you really yeah. need to be in a setting. And, you know, a mouse brain is one thing, but, but a human yeah. brain, yeah, right. That's totally, I totally agree. And that's the problem. Like one of the virtual reality things that came out was a tibial um, nail. So it's a, you know, the, the shin bone breaks and you basically reduce it and you put a rod down and you have to mallet it down. And if you mallet it too lightly, it like it goes nowhere. And if you like ram it, it can go through the ankle joint. So you can't, you have to like, actually, you have to have a feel for how hard, what it feels like as it's going through the bone, what's normal resistance and what's not normal resistance. And I did the VR version because it was actually one of my friends that started this company and you're like swinging through air. And I'm like, this is, I mean, aside from teaching me like the steps of doing a tibial I am now, he's going to hate me for saying this, by the way. <laughs> um, but aside yeah. from doing the steps of a tibial I am now, it's like, you're not really getting the feel of what it is to do a, a tibial I am now. You need to do that like actually in someone. But I should say one thing that I think is really great that no one's really talking about that much, but is courses. So recently, so if I have to do a surgery I haven't done before, it's a complex surgery, cartilage transplant, big multi. So like I just did a realignment procedure in the knee with a cartilage transplant, and a ligament reconstruction, all in one patient. I had done them all separately, but not one like that. I just call up my representative from my company and I say, can you get me a cadaver knee? And then I just do it in a lab because, and that really gives you a feel. It allows you to kind of work with the instruments and figure out what's going to work and not work before you're doing it in the operating room. So pre COVID, I was going to a lot of courses. Like if new techniques came out, I would go to that course and I would do a cadaver lab and I would just learn that, that new technique and you meet people and you talk about how they approach it. And that's the way you really stay um, up to date with that stuff. And I think that's more helpful in my opinion than, than like a virtual reality type thing. What's Do you the know craziest? Any... Oh, oh, sorry, you could go. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, what's the craziest trauma experience that you had? <laughs> the craziest trauma experience. Oh gosh, there were so many. I was at MGH. I I feel like we just we got a lot. Um, 
Okay. My probably the, the worst one that really sticks out in my mind is we had a kid who was driving um, and had his hand out the window, never drive with your limbs out, out a window. Um, and someone hit him and the car rolled over and it amputated him at his forearm. And so they brought him in and then they brought his hand and arm in, in a separate bag. And that was when I was interested in hand surgery. And that was in entire night into next day, 12 hour surgery of putting that back together because you have to put the bones back together, then the tendons back together, then the nerves and the arteries and the veins, and then the skin. And just, it's a very long, tedious surgery. Um, but that was probably one of the more like stunning ones um, that I had seen. I mean, in terms of pure trauma, the worst things you're gonna see are people hit by trains, which unfortunately are usually people jumping in front of trains um, in terms of the level of amount of trauma. Um, and then always motorcycle crashes are always pretty bad. So never ride a motorcycle. <laughs> I always tell that to, to my friends and my husband. <laughs> so, but that was, that was probably the more, I guess I would say interesting one that I saw. Do you know of any opportunities for high school students that could help uh teach us about surgeries or anything like that, like summer programs? So, unfortunately, I so I, not unfortunately, but the, the one I know is geared towards female students, just because I've worked with it before. There's something called the Perry Initiative, which is basically advocating for getting more um, females into um, math, science, um, and orthopedic surgery. Um, and they do that once a year. As for everyone um i i don't know of one off the top of my head but i should say i'm always happy to have people join me from a research perspective as i said i'm doing things here and there i writing up articles i wrote up a rehab journal thing like that but i'm not doing like research level research but i always tell people i'm always happy to have someone shadow me join me in my clinic once everything's okay with covid you know join me in the operating room and that way you can kind of see everything firsthand from seeing a patient in the clinic and then seeing what i do in the operating room and then seeing them as as post ops There is a program at Johns Hopkins that's pre-college, um, oh, and I think it's called. I want to say it's so you want to be a doctor or something, something, <laughs> something funny. catchy like that. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and it teaches some basic, really, really basic stuff. Like the most in depth they do is um, yeah. casting and and uh, sutures on a model. Oh, but, that's good because that's what. So I was just thinking, like the Perry Initiative, and I think it's important because. So in orthopedics, only 6% are women and it's the only surgical subspecialty where that hasn't changed. Like even neurosurgery is beating us at this point, which is astounding, you know? So I think that's why they're doing that. But the, but what they do is, is very cool and would be great for anyone who wants to go into orthopedics. It's partly what you said, where it's like you're suturing pig's feet and you're casting. But um, recently I did this module where we're doing multi-ligament knee reconstruction, just using regular like, um, uh, saws for and like drills from home depot and like using these little um kind of plaster screws and stretchy like rubber bands to reconstruct the ligaments and where they go and why and i just found like everyone leaves that day and is like that was such a cool experience so like it sounds like the hopkins lab is kind of similar to that in terms of getting people hands-on and being able to like you know use drills and and put rods down saw bone femurs and and suture pig's feet and and all that stuff and i feel like that's really um it's a lot of fun how elite were your academics in high school? How, what did you say? Like how elite, like your GPA? Your SAT um, and scores my like GPA that? in high school, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm sorry, I don't remember my GPA in high school, but it was, it was good. <laughs> um, in undergrad, I was um, cum laude. So what is that? Like, um, so I wasn't like summa cum laude, but I was cum laude. It was biochem and orgo, just, I got to be an orgo. I couldn't, I couldn't get be an orgo. Orgo is so hard. I hope that they take it out by the time, you know, you guys reach pre-med um, because yeah, it's just the worst. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry if I offended any chemistry teacher on the, on the, <laughs> on this today, but it was just so hard. Um, and so, you know, it's, you have to have, you have to have a good GPA, you know, to, to apply and get into medical school, but everything is also fixable, right? So like you had a not great GPA, you can do additional classes to build that up. You know, you didn't do your, your prereqs, right? You do a post back, you know, program type thing. Um, MCATs, you know, MCATs are, is a challenging test. I feel like it's very much like the SAT and that you're more studying how to take the test 
rather than the actual substance of the test. Everything else in orthopedics, the boards is all how much information you know, but the MCAT is like very much um, like kind of an intuitive type test. And so it can be challenging. You don't do well in it, take it again, you know? And so it's one of those things where you can always, you can always do better, you know, you put in more work and do better. Um, but yeah, I guess by and large, you have to have a good GPA in, in high school and, and, in, and in medical school to really kind of take, or in, in undergrad to kind of take that next step. What's the most interesting thing you've seen while working? So, I would say probably I'll, I'll phrase that as one of the more interesting surgeries that I did recently, which I guess is kind of one of the more interesting things that I've seen. So um, I had this gentleman who was playing basketball with his son, his young son who ran around him and he planted his foot and he twisted and his whole leg just went dead. Um, and he saw me and this was COVID. So it was a pain to get an MRI. He didn't want to come into the office. Um, I saw him and his leg from the knee down, he couldn't move at the ankle and the toes. Um, blood supply was good, but he just had no nerve function. Um, and so we got an MRI and it looked like he had a pretty bad, what's called a multi-leg knee injury where his ACL was only partially torn, but the whole outside of his knee, all the ligaments that stabilize the outside of the knee were torn. And in doing that, when he did that, he also injured the nerve that runs on the outside of the knee. And so he had a nerve palsy, which is basically he was unable to move his foot. And he was in his, you know, late thirties, I believe had a young son and he couldn't walk because his foot was paralyzed. Um, so I took him middle of COVID, um, having to, you know, we had to argue to get that case on because no cases were going, there was shutdowns everywhere in terms of what can and cannot go. They were trying to take the ventilator from our surgery center and bring it over to the hospital. So we wouldn't have even had a, a surgery center to operate at. Um, and so we, you know, we got the case on and, and when I got in there, the nerve was really badly damaged. We cleaned it up. We did a repair, we repaired everything. And then two weeks function starts to come back, four weeks function starts to come back. And by the sixth week, he was moving his foot, didn't need a brace, full function, stability of the knee. He's back to playing basketball with his son. So I would say that was probably the most, the coolest, the most interesting, and probably the the most rewarding career uh, moment in my career that I've had thus far. What would it be like to go into sports medicine without also being a surgeon? So it is still um, very enjoyable. So that's the cool thing about sports medicine. It sounds so cheesy when I say this, but it really is a team. So the way, um, you know, the, the way that all of the different roles work together is very important. So like my experience with the Eagles, um, I met this uh, colleague of mine who's now still a very good friend. I'm actually seeing her this weekend. She lives out in Seattle, but we're both vaccinated. So we're going to see each other. She was director of rehab for the Philadelphia Eagles. And her role was to come up with evidence-based return to play um, algorithms for like, when can a player go back in and when can't they go back in? And then she would work with the trainers to optimize them, to get them ready for that. The doctors would see, um, the patients and make sure that they were safe. Um, and then we would kind of all work together to figure out that this patient was, was good to go. And I felt like having everyone be an expert in their area and then working together led to the best outcome for that patient. And I've always taking that with me and said, you know, it shouldn't just be in the NFL that we're doing that. We should be doing that high school level, collegiate level, because no one can know everything about everything, right? You can't, you'll be a master of none. So you, you, t you should be an expert in your area and then work with other people who are experts in their field to come up with the best kind of care plan. And so I feel like that's, that's really important. And a component of that is the non-operative side of sports medicine. So um, they deal with a lot of the non-orthopedic side of sports. So concussions, um, uh, exercise-induced asthma, contusions of the, um, of the lung cavity. Um, the one that really jumps out in my mind is um, with the Jets, um, Sam Darnold got mono and he had an enlarged um, spleen and he couldn't go back into play until the spleen size came down because if you get hit and you have a large spleen, it can rupture and you can bleed to death. So he was being monitored by the non-operative sports medicine doctors with ultrasounds and everything to make sure he was safe before he was going back in. So there's, I almost feel like they do a lot more work than us because we just have ortho. We just have like the shoulders and the knees and like the limbs and that's it. Like they have the heart, 
the lungs, the GI tract, the kidneys. People get hit from the back and they have kidney issues. They get hit in the chest, they have a rib fracture. And so there's a lot, a lot that needs to be managed that isn't orthopedics. And that's what our non-operative colleagues do. You were drawing this the distinction in training between college and med school and mm -hmm. and you you made the comment that in med school you just learn a lot of stuff yeah. in in the in your experience recently are you still seeing that or is there a trend in in a different direction like what's your perspective on that because there's more of a push in higher education as, and especially secondary education away from content and more towards I don't know, self-esteem or something like that. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing yeah. that at the upper echelon. Yeah, definitely. I do feel, I'll answer that kind of in two parts. So one, I do feel like they're trying to get rid of a lot of the noise, right? There's a lot of things you learn in, you know, I <laughs> not to hate on Orgo again, but like, do you really need to know how to take this molecule and bring it to this molecule in order to be like a orthopedic surgeon? Like probably not. So there's a lot of trying to take away some of the extra years of training and extra knowledge that we're, we're forcing into people's brains to try to allow them to actually have this like high, you know, an efficient education in terms of what they're actually going to need to use moving forward. As for the more like a mental side of things, absolutely. So like physician burnout, and medical student burnout is a very real thing. And um, they've tried now, ACGME work hours is one way, but they've tried to also look at people in terms of making sure their experience while they are in training as a student and a trainee is also a positive one. So at Harvard, we have 60 people total, 12 um, residents a year for five years. So it's 60, give or take a couple stragglers that did like an MPH and stuck around or things like that. And it, in 60 is a lot for a residency program and you can kind of get lost in the shuffle. So we created these things called societies where basically it's two from each class in a society and we would get together and do fun things like ice fishing or um, take a boat out onto the Charles or, you know, just go to dinner, things like that. And it just makes it a little bit, um, just kind of reminds you that, you know, work-life balance, right? There's things on, on the other side of things. So you're learning. And a lot of those things we'd even be learning at, you know, we'd be talking about ortho while we were at dinner and things like that, but it makes it a little bit more, um, uh, survivable is not the right works that makes residency sound bad, but it makes it a little bit more enjoyable. Oh, what's your opinion on a, uh, undergrad degree before med school as opposed to a six-year medical program straight out of high school? So that for me goes back to experience. So for me, I couldn't have done a six-year program out of, out of high school because I didn't think I was going into medical school. I think if you know and are confident that that's what you want to do, that's great because that cuts out two years of, of, of extra, you know, education that maybe you don't need. And they're doing that over in Europe. I mean, you can go right from high school into kind of like a medical school track and it's decreasing the amount of time. And also here in the U S the amount of expense that you're putting into that education. But for me, I felt like if there had been a six year biochemistry, you know, pharmaceutical track, I would have chosen that and that would have been wrong. Even to this day, sometimes I think that we didn't have a plastic surgery rotation at my medical school. And I wonder if I would have liked that because I liked a component of plastic surgery when I was in my residency as an intern when we rotated through there. So I feel like experiences are important. But if you know it's been your passion forever, you've done some shadowing, you know you want to be a doctor, I think that's great because I think it definitely cuts out two years of training um, and it's already a long road. And so it saves you that time and expense. You had mentioned the gender disparity, how there's so few percentage of women in your field. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on how that changes from your undergrad levels as you progressed up through? Yeah, so I would say in medical school, it was actually more females than males in my medical school. So I was like 51 or 52 and it's shifting that way. Um, I don't know the exact percentage, so I don't wanna make it up, but it was over 50% female. And then it was shifting even more to that last time that I checked. Um, then in, you know, for sciences too, I found like my biochemistry in undergrad, it was a lot of females. Medical school, same thing. 
Ortho residency, not so much. Um, my program had a fair number of females. Um, the year above me had four females out of 12. I was the only female in my class. And it was a very supportive environment, but it definitely, it, it, it can make it a little bit challenging to find mentors. Um, you know, you have male mentors, but it can make it challenging when you only have one or two attendings that are, you know, female that you can meet with and talk about experiences with and things like that. So we definitely have a ways to go with orthopedics. I think the problem specifically to orthopedics um, is that people think you need to be um, some big male jock in order to do it. And even my patients think that they'll be like, I don't know if you're strong enough to be an orthopedic surgeon. It's like, I think people think we're just like wielding a sledgehammer in the OR and just like hitting things with it. Like it's still surgery. It's very, you know, controlled and, and, and very, um, you know, meticulous. Um, but people have this impression. And so a lot of, um, you know, female medical students I talked to are like, Oh, I can't be an orthopedic surgeon. It's just like, you have to be big and strong. And I'm like, you really don't. So I think it's that misconception that leads to that gap because in undergrad, pretty equal medical school, pretty equal, almost maybe more female ortho just plummets down, you know, and we are trying to address that, but it's been kind of stuck at 6% for the last five plus years. So working in the women's sports medicine center, can you comment on, on, well, one, do you, do you work on uh, males and, and two, uh, why the necessity to have a separate organization? Mm -hmm. So um, I get asked that question a lot. Yes, I operate on males and females. I would say it's probably like 60, 40, maybe 70, 30 females versus males. Um, and why we need a, um, a second, you know, a separate women's sports medicine center. I think it's a couple reasons. One, it's, I think, to address some level of neglect that exi that exists in sports medicine for our female athletes. A lot of times when I was in my training and we would cover sports events, you know, the male sports events would have tons of coverage, you know, the collegiate you know, sports events would have tons of coverage and female events, they, they couldn't find coverage. Even like high level gymnastics events, just like they just didn't hold the same like, wow, that drew people to want to cover it. So that led to being undercovered from a physician standpoint, um, which is not safe for the for those female athletes. So from from that side, I feel like that's important. But two, um, female athletes have different conditions, different um, incidences of injury that differ from males um, and that can be prevented. So ACL is the one that really comes to mind. So ACL is significantly higher, 10 to one in females versus males. And a lot of that is preventable. A lot of that is because they tend to have quad dominance, um, weak hamstrings, the way they land tends to be their knee collapses in. And a lot of this can be corrected with preventative programs, but no one knows to do these preventative programs if you don't have someone highlighting these um, risk factors and then correcting them. And I had a run of four females with ACL injuries from the same soccer team from the same high school in a matter of a week and a half. And I asked their trainer, did you do an ACL prevention program? And she said, yes. I said, oh, what are you doing? She's like, we did the one on Saturday for 30 minutes. And I said, oh, that's not ACL prevention programs need to be on a daily basis, 30 minutes prior for at least six weeks. And so I realized that there's just a lot of um, misinformation out of there that really can be corrected and really prevent a lot of these injuries in female athletes. And so that's, I think, another reason. And then lastly, is that it goes back to the 6% a lot of orthopedic surgeons are males. And sometimes my female patients just feel more comfortable with, with a female surgeon and they should have that choice. And it can be hard to find a, a female orthopedic surgeon just because it's only 6%. And so having a women's sports medicine center, they are now aware of that. And they have a female surgeon. If they want to see a female surgeon, they have a choice just like their you know male colleagues have a choice to, to choose. So, you're, so your center actually employs both? Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, okay. I'm the only female orthopedic surgeon in, in my group and the group is part of OINJ. So of the sports medicine surgeons, there are five of us um, that do pure sports and um, four, four are males and I'm the, the female. And then we have a non-operative sports medicine physician, um, Dr. Fareen Shamim, she's female. Uh, and then we have a variety of PAs um, in rheumatology as well as um, orthopedics as well as pain management, joint replacement. So I think it's a pretty well-rounded group. Okay, we don't wanna hold her up too much. Uh, <laughs> last call, last questions, anybody? 
So other than ACL tears, what other major orthopedic related injuries are uh, more common in females than males or vice versa? So, um, so ACLs are a big one for the knee. Um, so patellofemoral pain, so having anterior knee pain um, related to how the kneecap tracks um, in the groove of the knee, uh, having that pain is higher in females due to hundreds of different factors. So on um, the wider hips leading to a steeper angle, having thinner cartilage in the knee than do males, which predisposes to higher pain levels, um, having more laxity of the ligaments. So the kneecap moves more and causes more irritation. So that's, that's one thing. And then also shoulder um, instability, not traumatic. Um, males tend to have a higher incidence of traumatic shoulder instability. Um, a lot of times because they're doing a lot more um, high level uh, traumatic inducing uh, activities. Um, but females tend to have more multi-directional shoulder instability, which is instability without trauma. Um, so basically because again, their ligaments are more lax, their shoulder moves more and that can cause more um, micro injuries of the surrounding structures around the shoulder. So those are the two main ones, patellofemoral um, and multi-directional shoulder instability. Anybody else? Last call. Alaska. We'll try to get her back on campus mm -hmm. another time, if possible, once we're yeah, that would be great. Open. Well, thank you very much. This was uh, this was really good. Um, it, uh, the kids I know were really hoping to get a you know a surgeon. I thought this would be good. I, yeah, I think, yeah. The 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 women's issues are also really. I have twin sisters who played basketball mm -hmm. in college, and both of them tore everything you can possibly think of in both yeah. legs so we were yeah and i don't know if you yeah. noticed but some of the teachers were like sitting here kind of squirming through your stories because like yeah. i could do i'll do any specialty i could do thoracic any of the <laughs> brain stuff but the carpentry involved in <laughs> I know, that was one of the things that made me switch <laughs> it's so it's so funny that you say that. I feel like that's also what leads you to choose a certain field in medicine. Mm -hmm. It was like I did one day on anesthesiology where like a spit soaked tube came out of someone's throat and I was like, no, <laughs> I'm not, I can't do that. Like I just I can't do that. And then GI too, like there's two routes. Someone sees intestines and thinks it's cool or someone sees intestines and never wants to see intestines again so it's like very polarizing so people see like bendy limbs when they're broken and they kind of look like gumby and people are like no and i'm like i i like that you know and you you kind of figure out what you like i know i'm sorry i just saw you squirm off, off, <laughs> off the camera. <laughs> sorry I, I, you figure out what what you like through those potentially um traumatizing experiences but you still <laughs> you still realize what you like as you go through it just comparatively i study fish guys i study <laughs> 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 well thank you thank awesome. you very much um, thank you thank you, you for your, having me this is a lot of fun and like i said if there's any other questions please feel free to shoot me an email you're never bothering me so always you know shoot me an email i'll get right back to you no questions a dumb question all right. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. And uh, just a quick announcement. Um, Chin will be presenting, uh, let me see, I have it open. The potent CAR T cells engineered with Sleeping Beauty transposon vectors display a central memory phenotype. And she's going to make it really, really interesting. It was published in Gene Therapy. So that'll be next week's Journal Club. And she's going to make it really interesting. Good luck, <laughs> Chin. Um, all right. So thank you very much. Of course. All Thank right. you. Have a wonderful night. All right. Good night. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.